My name is Rob Jackson. I'm originally from the Bronx, New York. My, yeah, all right. Uh, my mother's from Brooklyn, and my father's from Harlem. Whoops, I didn't want you to see that yet. Um, my mother retired from Victoria's Secret Catalog as the office manager slash receptionist, and my father says that, he, that he's been in data processing since 1964, okay? So I did say data processing, and I did say 1964, okay? So this is serious stuff we're talking about here, and he's bugging out over this thing I got in my pocket here. So in 1964, my father lived in Harlem, but he would drive to Westchester on the night shift and process punch cards in the mainframe and do all that kind of stuff, right? What he realized is that there was excess capacity in the mainframe that they weren't using. So the Harlem hustler that he is, he went to all of the churches in the New York City area, and he said, listen, give me your tithe envelopes, and I'll give you back a report. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa what are you talking about? So he built this business. He had 13 churches in the New York City area, and he basically used the excess capacity in these mainframes to publish his reports. Names, addresses, you know, daughter's birthday, how much tithe you gave, all that kind of stuff. And for these churches, this was the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? So one day, I guess it's 1973 now if we move forward, my father is thinking I'm going to, he has a growth mentality, right? He said, I want to build my business. And so he goes down to the Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. So anybody know uh, Manhattan, New York City? So Fifth Avenue Baptist Church, big deal, right? So he walks in, gives his pitch, and the pastor says, Mr. Jackson, I'm sure you have a fine business, but we're not interested right now. So he takes it on the chin, walks out, and goes home. Around the same time, I am uh, five years old, and I'm taking Suzuki violin lessons. I'm on 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, and the teacher who's teaching me the violin lesson says, hey, have you ever thought about having Rob get tested for private school? And so my parents were like, oh, yeah, of course. So I took the test. I did well. And my father is now looking at all these different schools to send me to. So he's walking through the hall with the headmaster of the school, and the headmaster says, oh, I want to introduce you to the religion teacher. And the religion teacher looks up and says, oh, Hudson Jackson. And the headmaster looks at the religion teacher and my father and goes, how do you two know each other? And it just so happens that the religion teacher was the, Baptist, uh, was the pastor at the Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. So right there in that moment, there was a connection, right? Something happened where this Harlem guy with a wife from Brooklyn, with a son who lived in, in the Bronx, made a connection. And this is what it looks like. That was my introduction into education. That one moment. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm that guy over here. <laughs> so I bring that story up because it, it kind of encapsulates what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk. Okay. My father always said to me, the reason I'm sending you to this school is so that you have access and exposure. Right? I don't want you to go up there and think that you're going to be a rich kid and da da da. I want you to think about it this way. And being that he has all of these clients that are churches, he said, I want you to have a Moses mindset. He said, I want you to know the mind of the Pharaoh. I was like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> right? I'm five years old, six, seven, eight years old, and he's telling me about the mind of, the mind of a Pharaoh. So, okay, access and exposure. So right now, there's a lot of talk in Silicon Valley and everywhere about diversity and income inequality, right? I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm going to acknowledge that I have my own entry point into these subjects that I think is important that was informed by my education. So for me, education is my entry point into these conversations. Affirmative action and meritocracy are often talked about as if they're two separate things. Me, the little kid, the five-year-old who did well on the test, who's like, I did it. I made it. I crossed over. I am live in the Bronx, but I'm going to school on Park Avenue between, I mean, 73rd Street between Park and Lex. I've arrived. I did it. I did something great, and it's going to propel me into wherever I'm going to be. 
But the business case for affirmative action is this little black kid in my institution is going to make the institution better. So I had this you know, a little back and forth. Is this for me? Am I the, the, the lab rat that they want to see what's going to happen when they put me in this situation? Or is it really about me doing something good or being able to say that I've accomplished something? My talk is about the tension between the institution and the individual. And I think that's what we need to focus on when we talk about education and diversity and all that other kind of stuff. Who is it serving? Right, right now, education is serving the institution. But I think what's happening is there's a shift happening and there's a lot of forces that I'm going to talk about that are pushing us away from an institution mindset into focusing more on the individual. Right? So I'm going to talk about these big factors or trends that come through and I just want to share it with you to get your thoughts on it. So we all know this, we're all geeks and techies and all that kind of stuff. Rapid advances in computing, digital storage, and bandwidth. That's the big one. Changes everything. Changes the relationship that we have to the institution. How? Structurally, it says information is ubiquitous and expertise is relative. It's no longer associated with an institution. Right? We can, if we know somebody who has that information, if we have access to them, what do we need the institution for? Right? That's huge. That's a big shift, and I don't think we talk about it enough. When I was, uh, in 1997, I was with a company called Value America, and I allude to it in my bio, but what I learned the internet was doing was called disintermediation. It's a big term, and it means cutting out the middleman. Education should pay attention to that, because if we cut out the middleman, education might be more efficient, and it might serve the purposes that it was attended to, and I'll get to that in a minute. I love this graphic because it kind of sums up what I'm talking about, or at least in the first part. The foundation of this change is computing, digital storage, and bandwidth, right? But what we really have is the uniting of the personal and the professional, right, into the single person where we've cut out any noise in the signal, but the most important part is we have this device here, right? This device and this change that we had in bandwidth and storage and, and uh, bandwidth is allowing us to look at education differently. Personalization. It's been something that we've been talking about in the education world for a long time, and the individual lists have been losing the fight, right? The big box mentality, the Frederick Winslow Taylor, all of that kind of stuff where one size fits all, everybody goes through the conveyor belts. We've been losing that fight, but technology and the, the trends that I'm talking about now are moving us in a direction where the education that we have now is not working. Technology is doing a lot of this stuff that education used to do, and we have to rethink what we mean by education. So education is still the key, but it's not the key that it used to be. Why? Big move is identity and image. And I don't mean preoccupation in a demeaning or, or condescending way, but Identity is more important today than it was for my father, right? He retired from Toys R Us. And for him, being an operator for Toys R Us was the biggest thing in the world. Or how about, have you seen that uh, GE commercial where the developer comes back to the dorm or whatever it is with his friends and he says, hey, I'm working for GE. And they all look at him like he's crazy. Our parents would have been like, oh, yeah, GE. But this new generation of employees is like, no, you're the all-powerful coder. What are you doing that for? You don't have to give over yourself to GE. You, you've either sold out or I don't really understand who you are anymore. So your identity is in question. But this whole idea goes even further to the celebrity culture, to video. And just so you know what I'm talking about, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? It's something that we all know and we all understand. But really what I want to get into is this idea of the saturated self. Right? My dissertation advisor, I'm in a PhD program, supposedly, but my uh, dissertation advisor wrote a book called The Saturated Self. And basically what he says, there's this thing called the technology of saturation, where the media exposes us to multiple self-representations. So we are looking at all of these different people and all these different lives, and we get a chance to cherry pick 
what we like, the best parts out of what we see, and rub it in our skin like lotion. And I think that's powerful, right? That didn't happen. That 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 never happened before. You would have to have a lot of money, or a, a naval job where it would take you to other places to be able to see the wide variety of people that are on the planet. That didn't happen before until now. So I like Woody, but let's keep moving. What that does is, is it makes us question whether people are really who they say they are, right? This whole idea of style versus substance. Are they looking the part really well, or are they really doing the job, right? Because now this image is all important. And this idea of cherry picking all these different selves and putting it together leaves you wanting whether it's real or not. At the same time, we're moving from a modern to a postmodern society. That's another factor. So anytime you see anything up there like that, that's what I'm talking about, these big trends. And we're moving from this kind of scientific certainty to this uncertainty, where the person who you thought you were talking to may not be who you thought they were. Or the economy is uncertain because the indicators that we're using to measure its growth may not be giving us the, the right answer back. Right? So I think aesthetically that's happening all over in all kinds of fashions. But a lot of us talked about, a lot of the presenters talked about the ability to be anything that you want to be. Right? This fluidity of an identity or this ability to transform yourself or be your real true self is something that has been opened up before and education hasn't necessarily responded to it. So I like this image, not just because of the image in Time Magazine, but they talk about it being the next civil rights frontier. Well, I understand that, but I think it's a little bit bigger than that. I think the next civil rights frontier is access and exposure, right? If I tell you who I am, what access does that give me to information and resources? And what access does it give me, or what exposure, what does it expose me to? Do I get a chance to see all the things that I want to see and do all the things I want to do? So to me, this is the next civil rights struggle. And education is where I thought this was, this, this is what I thought education was doing because that's what my father told me, right? He said, you're going there to get exposed and get access to these people that you didn't have before. This whole idea of reinventing yourself. <laughs> School doesn't necessarily teach you how to reinvent yourself. You've got to figure that out on your own. If I've made a mistake or if I've gone to prison and I'm a returning citizen, they tell you to go to school in order to change your life circumstances. The education is the key. But education is not going to help you reinvent yourself. You have to do that on your own. And that's the trouble. Thank you. For me, the, the biggest trend that I think that's affecting the youth and people of my generation, I consider myself to be of the hip-hop generation, is that hip-hop came along and said, we're going to teach each other. We're going to learn from each other. It's all about the come up, if you know what I mean when I say that, or it's all about putting people on, right? So there's this zeitgeist out there, and I'm not talking about the people who listen to hip-hop. I'm talking about the people who participate and make hip-hop, the people who make hip-hop what it is, and I'm not talking about what's on the radio because I don't listen to the radio. But what I'm talking about is this belief system that I can reinvent myself, that I can take nothing and make it into something. Right? That's something that didn't happen before, and education hasn't necessarily responded to this. But it's everywhere. You can't turn on the TV or do anything without seeing hip-hop something. But it's in our kids. It's in the DNA now. And Education needs to do something about that. So hip-hop also brings this thing about authenticity, where I, we were talking about before about fluid identity and style and substance and people not knowing whether you're real or not. Well, hip-hop has this thing where you got to keep it real, right? Where did that come from? And what was the, where did the need for keeping it real come from? It came from this fluidness, from this people not necessarily knowing where you stand on certain things. So in the interest of keeping it real, I am Blue Black from the Unspoken Herd. I have released a, a hip hop album in 2001, and I am constantly reinventing myself from that time, even before that time, from Buckley and until now, but there's no place that I can go or anybody I can talk to about how to do that. 
I had to figure it out on my own, right? I also had the pleasure of doing the theme song for the Boondocks television show. And I love this show because of him, <laughs> of him, but because they have him too, right? There's this civil rights intergenerational thing going on in the show that's so subtle. I mean, to me, it's subtle. It may not be subtle to other people, but when Aaron came up with the idea and asked us to do the song, he was throwing and pitching us ideas, and we were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Aaron, whatever. But when you really think about what it is that this kind of show did, is it kind of cemented in popular culture all of the things that I've been talking about before. Why do you have to compromise, and why do you have to play the game anymore? If information is ubiquitous, if I can reinvent myself and do whatever it is that I want to do, why should I join an institution and be a part of an institution that's going to give me a credential, but I still have to do something with the credential? I still have to find a job. I still have to make connections. I still have to network. I still have to do all these things because that's not what the school is designed to do. The schooling that I got got me into the next school and got me into the next school and got me into the PhD program, supposedly. But the whole idea is that people don't have these to make those same kind of choices anymore. And education is not necessarily responding. So the biggest trend is money, right? In hip hop, anywhere, Donald Trump, if you have money, you're real. It's real. Whatever you're doing is real. Nobody can argue with you, right? So this is a trend that is pushing us away from the institution to the individual. And education, should be paying attention to this. There's new kinds of capital, right? Likes, followers, all that kind of stuff that people are using and exchanging for money that didn't exist before. But how does that fit into education? It really doesn't. But the, big, the biggest thing is economic success is all about technology and a brand. So many of you probably seen this slide before. But Uber has no vehicles. Facebook has no content. Alibaba has no inventory, and Airbnb has no real estate. These are the, some of the biggest companies in the world. This is what economic success looks like in the world today. How did education contribute to that today, and how is education going to contribute to that tomorrow? That's my big question. Is this the direction that we need to go? One. But two, what is education's role in economic success? Education is the key is what I've heard all of my life, what most of us have heard. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'm advocating is for a shift in mindset so that it's not an either or. It's not a choice between an institution or an individual that we all think of ourselves as individuals, I mean as institutions, the institution of me. So I can get my taxes done. I can get a sleep number bed. I can get all of my finances put together in one place. So basically, all of the tools and everything that I need are at my disposal. Why do I need to join an institution? Why can't I think of myself as the institution? Donald Trump is doing that right now, right? Is Donald Trump hip hop? I don't know. But, but the point is, he's using the same trends that I'm talking about to be successful in the politics. So when I talk about education, I mean attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of their fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. And that came from the Epic of America, which is where this whole idea of the American dream came from. But is education oriented around this? No. Are we talking about education or are we talking about learning and growth? I think we're talking more about learning and growth. If information is ubiquitous and I can do all these things on social media. Are we talking about jobs in a consumption economy or are we talking about talent and opportunity? The way education is set up right now is for jobs and consumption. It's not set up for talent and opportunity. You may create opportunities, and you may get into a situation like my father where you're doing something that connects you to something, and magically it happens, 
But he had to go out there and do all of those things. He had to have that entrepreneurial spirit. He had to have that growth mindset. Nobody taught him that in school. So making a living, how to live, same thing. I'll end with this. It used to be what you know and who you know. Now it's who knows you and for what. That's the shift, right? So if you know me as a pedophile, that's it. It's fixed. I can't move from that. But if you know me as LeBron James, it's fixed. Can't move from that. And you know me. And you know me for what? If you, if you look at how society has moved, we have to build education so that people can grow themselves and learn more about themselves and move into their best selves by sampling the best of what they see around them. Again, access and exposure, right? If, if we have devices in our pockets that give us access and exposure to people, places, information, and things, what role does education serve? Credentials, I get it, right? But if I tell you that I got a degree from Harvard, it's not the degree from Harvard that makes me valuable. It's the relationships that I have with the people at Harvard or the other people who have graduated from Harvard. So it's back to, if I did graduate from Harvard, what do the people from Harvard think about me and what do they know about me? So my education has to be about building the institution of me so that people know who it is and what I do, what my capabilities are, so that I can go to the next level. So, disintermediation, cut out the middleman. Personalization, get down into it. Even, you know, DNA, RNA, go to sleep, figure it all out. We have all the technology now, we're moving in that, that direction where we can do all that stuff. And reinvention. If school is not moving in this direction, then what is it doing? And that's my, my question. So, what I've done is, uh, I submitted an application in DC for a virtual adult public charter school. And the application got denied because one, they didn't trust technology. And two, they didn't understand some of the trends and the forces that I was talking about. But if you look maybe two years after I submitted, the 2014 after I submitted my proposal, all of these West Coast Silicon Valley schools came out with this whole idea of MOOCs and all that other kind of, so DC wasn't ready, and I'll just say that, right? But what I would say is the institution of education wasn't ready, and technology is helping us transition and do all of this stuff, and education is not a part of it, unfortunately. So Pitch Love is my uh, business. I'd love to talk to you about it, but I see that I'm out of time. The idea is everything starts with a pitch, and if you pitch me your idea, I'll connect you with the people who can help you make it happen. That's the new 21st century education. So thank you. I hope I ran out of time.